this measures the sort of information lost if you don't use the correct model. Okay? So there's one way of thinking about it. So there's, it's got a number of different important mathematical properties. Okay? So the first one, which is absolutely crucial for what I'm going to talk about in the context of thermodynamics, okay, is positivity. Okay? So the Kullback Leiber divergence is generically positive. This thing is called Gibbs inequality. And it's a sort of standard uh, textbooks exercise to prove that positivity. I have the proof here. I just don't want to waste too much time going through you know, very well-known proofs. So you can essentially prove that positivity okay, by uh, the method of Lagrange uh, multipliers. So for example, you know, if you think about the variation of the kullback leibniz divergence, okay, you can look for an extremum yeah, subject to the constraint that P and Q are probability distributions. And you can actually show that the minimum is zero and it's unbounded from both. That's sketchy for the proof, but I just wanted to point it out. If you look at any standard uh, information theory textbook, you'll find a proof of the positivity and I urge you to look at it. I recommend the books by Cover and Thomas or the book by McKay has it as well. Okay? These are different books that have that. Uh, it's unbounded in general from above, okay? so it's got no upper bound. And uh, okay, it's, uh, so it's unbounded. And it's uh, generically additive for independent distributions. Say P is P1, P2, Q is Q1, Q2, then uh, D, P, Q, okay, is equal to D, P1, Q1, plus D, P2, Q2, okay? So positivity is the most important property for thermodynamics, as we're going to see, okay? It allows us, it will allow us to make various statements on the average sort of positivity of, of dissipation in, in non-equilibrium processes, okay? That's somehow a miracle that it appears there in the, in the, in the equations. The other important mathematical property of the kullback leiber divergence, which means that it's not a distance in, the, in, this, in that sense, okay? Is that it's not symmetric. So um, D P Q is not equal to D Q T, okay? And that's going to be an important property from the perspective of thermodynamics as well because there is an inherent asymmetry in dissipative processes, okay? So it appears in that respect, uh, that mathematical property is inherited, it's an important property. The other property is that it's less important for what I'm going to say, but let me say it anyway, is that it's uh, convex okay, in a, in, a, in a pair of probabilities. So I, I don't need to get into the details, okay. Okay, so, so that's what it looks like. So what you can see it as essentially is, is just a mathematical measure of distinguishability between two probability distributions, classical probability distributions, okay, and it appears in various different guises in the, in the literature and various different things. Okay, so Let's get straight to the quantum um, version, okay? So the quantum relative entropy, it's just a rapid fire. Um. And by the way, you'll find, you know, reams of literature on both classical and quantum relative entropy on the internet, on, in textbooks, etc. cetera. Um, two very good references, earlier references, where it, you know, it started to play a very important role in um, the beginning of, I would say, quantum information theory in the sort of late 90s. There's one by um, Schumacher and Westmoreland. Uh, you can find it on the archives. Uh, Zero, 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 four, five, uh, around 2001. And the other one was uh, Vladko Vedral's single author RMP uh, around 2002. Okay? 
So I think my understanding is that that RMP by, by Vladko was essentially based on his PhD thesis, okay? So, um, so in, those, in those references you'll find many different things about its connection to quantum information theory. But how is it defined, right? So less uh, rho, sorry, let rho and sigma be density matrices. And the, rel the quantum relative entropy, which I denote by S, is equal to the trace of uh, rho log rho minus the trace of rho uh, log sigma, okay? So you see that the first term here, yeah, is minus the von Neumann entropy, okay? And you get this term here, which is the cross term between rho and sigma, okay? So this now, the claim is that this mathematical object, the quantum relative entropy, plays the same role for probability, sorry, it plays the same role for, for density matrices as the classical relative entropy, the kullback leibner divergence, plays for probability distributions, okay? So, um, the important property is its positivity, okay? So the positivity of the relative entropy, again, which I leave as an exercise or for you to look up, it just takes a few lines, it's not such a big deal, um, is crucial for what we're going to talk about uh, in the sort of thermodynamics part of this, right? So this is positive, and this result is called Klein's inequality. So I leave it as an exercise to prove Klein's inequality, okay? Or if you don't want to prove it and you're lazy, just look it up. You'll find it probably even on the Wikipedia page, okay? It's, uh, it's important, but it's positive. That's the, that's the key point. It's equal to zero when the density matrices are the same, and in general, like the classical case, it's unbounded from above, right? Um, you can have some problems with it, Right, so, you know, it's important that uh, S of rho sigma is less than infinity, okay, if the support of rho, okay, is contained in the support of sigma, okay? And by support, what I mean is the subspace spanned by eigenvectors of rho with non-zero eigenvalues. Okay? So it's bounded in that case. And it's also this got this similar property of joint convexity of its arguments, like the classical case, that's somehow less important. Right? The most important thing is that it is positive, unbounded in general from above, and it's also not symmetric in its arguments. Okay? It is not symmetric object in its arguments. Um, what else did I wanted to say about this before I move on? Yeah, okay, so I have an exercise, so every now and again. So another exercise that you can try to get comfortable is um, suppose a density operator rho k, okay, occurs with probability Uh, PK yielding uh, an average state, or sometimes called a signal state in information theory. Okay, uh, and suppose and suppose sigma is some other state. Okay. Prove the following, which is called Donald's identity. Okay. Prove that sum over k, pk, s oh, sorry. 
is equal to sum over k s rho k rho plus s rho sigma. Okay, this is called Donald's identity. It's a pretty easy few lines, and it'll just familiarize yourself if you're not that familiar with working with relative entropy. Okay, so have a go off it in your own time. And also, of course, these kind of relations are useful for proving other things in, 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 um, in quantum information theory, okay? In particular, in particular, where this type of thing, where a state appears, a density matrix appears with probability pk, although it's not my area of research, is in um, the sort of thinking about how much information can be sent down quantum channels. For example, how many people here have heard of Polevo's bound? Anybody not heard of Polevo's bound? One? Okay, let me, if there's only one, then I, I won't go through everything, but let me just explain the idea, okay? So a standard sort of assumption is, you know, you have some quantum channel, yeah? Alice is trying to send messages to Bob, yeah? And uh, these messages she encodes in um, density matrices, PK, okay? And Bob receives the output of what comes through the channel, and then he performs a POVM, okay, a generalized measurement, to try to decode Alice's messages, okay? So classically, if you, were, if you had classical information, what would, be the cap, what would be the channel capacity there? What would be the maximum amount of information that Alice could send to Bob? Shannon told us that. Anybody have any ideas? This is prior now to anything to do with Halevo. It's just Shannon's sort of in basic information theory. So Shannon told us that, you know, the most information that can be sent down that channel is the maximum over all inputs of the mutual information between Alice's encoding and Bob's decoding, okay? And what Halevo proved is that if you're using quantum systems, okay, to encode classical information, the issue is that unless these are encoded in orthogonal states, okay, then there's a fundamental upper bound on the mutual information given by something called a chi quantity, okay? So this is sets an upper bound on the maximum amount of information that can be sent in a quantum channel using quantum density matrices as the encoding part, right? And so let me just state, you know, basically the, the I'm skipping forward a little bit because I had, I didn't realize as many people would have known that. So the mutual information, okay, between Alice's inputs and Bob's outputs is bounded by chi. Chi is equal to the, uh, Von Neumann entropy of rho. Now what is rho? Suppose Alice encodes in states rho k with probability pk. These are states. Then the average signal shade of, the average sort of uh, state of the channel is going to be this, right? Okay? So Holevo says chi is equal to s of rho, okay, minus the sum over k, pk, where pk is the probability that message k occurs, okay, S of rho k. Now what's this got to do with relative entropy? Well, it turns out you can rewrite this thing, try yourself, as the sum over k, pk, the relative entropy between the signal states pk and the average state of the channel rho, okay? So this bounds the, mu the mutual information, okay, which sets a fundamental limit in the messages that, sorry, the information that uh, Bob can decode from Alice's sort of encodings, okay? Um, and uh, yeah, you see again, relative entropy appears in this sort of strongly information theoretical context. I'm just showing you that where it appears kind of prior to maybe, you might think prior to thermodynamics, although I'll tell you that it's not really the case, it was in information theory, okay? The other place where it appears, and you'll see a lot of that in the RMP by, by Vedra, is that it becomes a very nice way of thinking about quantification of correlations in quantum information theory as well. 
So for example, it has a role in addition to, to, to you know, proper information theory, there's also a role in entanglement theory. Okay? So imagine you have some Hilbert space H, which is composite, okay? Um, um, and now you imagine uh, all possible non-entangled states in the Hilbert space. So these are the separable states defined as sum over k, pk, sigma 1k, tensor sigma 2, K dot 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 sigma n k okay it's a convex sum of these uh, guys okay so these are states which are not entangled right by definition these are the separable states in the in the multiparticle Hilbert space right so what you can show is that if you want to quantify the entanglement in any given state so imagine that's the entire Hilbert space then you have this sort of blob of states which are the state sigma, all of the states sigma which are separable, okay? Which is actually a small subset of the entire Hilbert space, right? And you take this any arbitrary state here rho, okay? What you can show, at least mathematically, is that the minimum distance, or sorry, the minimum distinguishability between rho and the closest separable state is the entanglement of the state rho, okay? So this is called the relative entropy of entanglement, okay? So the minimum uh, over sigma of S rho sigma, all sigmas, okay, is the entanglement of rho, okay? Now, the problem is that from a practical perspective, yeah, that's an extremely difficult problem. That, min that, that minimization problem is, I think it's actually an MP hard problem, right? So, I mean, it's good to kind of get a sort of idea, geometric visual visualization of, um, of, of multipartite entanglement, but from the perspective of calculating things, it's, it's, it's not, not very useful. It's useful to prove theorems about entanglement. Um, so they're like, sort of a very sort of, you know, kind of whirlwind tour of some, some things in quantum information theory, Holevo bound and entanglement theory, but of course the topic of the lecture is actually the role of relative entropy um, in thermodynamics, right? And that's actually the reason I personally got interested in non-equilibrium thermodynamics in the first place when I saw it springing up in that context. So, to give you, uh, you know, a little bit of background and how I first got interested in that, I was mainly coming from more like many body physics background, doing sort of cold atoms, quench like numerics, etc. And I moved into a quantum information group in Oxford for my first postdoc, let's say. So it was the Vladko Vedral's group. So he was the person that did kind of all of the type of work on entanglement quantification and using relative entropy for, um, for. Um, for the purpose of analyzing entanglement structure. And uh, we started to think about results connecting relative entropy to thermodynamics, which, by the way, is a very old story, okay? Quantum relative entropy appears in non-equilibrium thermodynamics, um, you know, and it has been appearing since the 70s, okay? So, so let, me, let me explain to you the role in thermodynamics that I first came across. And we'll, we'll do this in a more pedagogical way, right? Because that's the point. So imagine I have some time-dependent Hamiltonian, okay? Which has some uh, parameter lambda, which can depend on time, right? So if you think about the adiabatic basis for the Hamiltonian, I think Steve was doing the adiabatic theorem yesterday, but... Um, so these are the states which diagonalize the Hamiltonian at any point in time. Okay, this is the E n lambda t, E n lambda t. Okay, this is the adiabatic basis. Now, what we're gonna assume uh, is that you do some protocol 
which generates a, a certain unitary, okay, where you take uh, lambda zero through some path in parameter space to lambda tau. Um, and we're going to assume the initial state of our system is thermal. It's a Gibbs state. So another interest of mine is actually the or like how do we how do we get stuff like the Gibbs state from pure state evolution, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Let's just assume a system in thermal equilibrium is well defined by a Gibbs state, right? So what do I mean? So uh, rho at lambda zero, okay, is equal to uh, z lambda zero um, exponential blah, 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 minus beta h lambda zero. So I start in thermal equilibrium, okay? Sometimes use this shorthand notation, uh, the initial state like this, to say that's in thermal equilibrium. Now, imagine I do the following, okay? I start to generate a really, really slow uh, manipulation of lambda. So I do delta lambda infinitesimally small, and I start to move in parameter space. And I move it in such a way that at each point in time, my system remains in thermal equilibrium at the same temperature, okay? This is an isothermal process, right? Same temperature. So in other words, if I do this and I do it well, okay, I go from rho i beta, which is thermal, to rho beta final, which is, uh, well, z lambda f, I'm sort of abusing notation here, apologize, exponential, minus beta h, well, lambda of tau or lambda f. So lambda tau is equal to lambda f. I'll sometimes abuse notation. Right? So you agree, each point, each, each point along this line now is a, is a thermal state at a different point in parameter space. Yeah? So, what it, so is this process unitary? Right, I see some nods. It's not, okay? And the reason is because although you fix the temperature, you of course change the entropy. This is an isothermal process. It is not an adiabatic process. An adiabatic process is unitary. An isothermal process is not in general, okay? So what's the work done in the isotherm basic thermodynamics, basic stat mech now? The work done. The change in free energy, okay? So the average work done, yeah, is the free energy difference. Now, it's very important when you work in this way. So isothermal processes are very special, yeah, because they're all, you're always in equilibrium, so you can apply the concepts of standard thermodynamics, and there, along that isothermal path, the free energy, the energy, the entropy are state functions. What do I mean by that? It means that I can compute stuff like the work. So the work is not a state function in general. You agree. It depends on the path. Yeah? I can move to lambda f. I can choose to do that very quickly, but then I, do, I can't legitimately describe my work as a free energy difference anymore, right? Not an equilibrium free energy difference, but it's only in isothermal processes that I can really, um, I can really uh, uh, use delta F. So delta F being, yeah, log of the partition functions, lambda F, lambda I, okay? So, now let's generalize this situation to a more generic transformation. And what I'm going to assume now is that um, I, so I have, the, this is the isothermal path. This goes from rho i beta to rho f beta, thermal equilibrium states along this line. And now what I assume is I do something very fast, yeah? So I go from lambda zero to lambda tau, lambda i to lambda f. I do that in a very brutal way and so fast that I can ignore at least, you know, in this time step, any dissipative process so that it's well de defined by a unitary transformation. So I do something like this in parameter space, right? And I get a state up here, okay, which is going to be given by sigma u rho i beta u dagger, where u, okay, let's be a bit more tau zero, 
generically speaking, is going to be exponential minus i h bar not tau uh, h lambda of t uh, dt. You agree? That would be the generic case. So you see, in general, you know, I'm pumping energy into the system. Depending on the type of protocol I choose, I generate a different unitary. So I get a family of unitaries, and I get a family of different sigmas, depending on how I choose to change lambda. Yeah? Um, so what now? So we've discussed two. The work done is delta f. So along one, this sort of unitary path, what is the work done on one? So two is delta f. In one, it's just going to be the energy change, right? So the work done is the trace of this state, well, h lambda tau sigma minus the trace of, well, the initial energy, right? So h lambda zero uh, rho i beta. So this is the energy change. This is the isolated system. So this is average work, delta f. Delta f is a state function, only depends on the endpoints, and you can see that the actual work now in a non-equilibrium manipulation depends on the path through the unitary that's generated. Right? Everybody's agreeing. Good. Now, OK, now, so the next thing is, um, well, OK, so, so you can define an isothermal deviation. So average work minus delta F. This is sometimes called dissipated work for a reason I'll uh, discuss in just a second. So what you do is you just define an energy, a, you know, an energy which is the excess energy of the isothermal path, right? And obviously, intuitively, on average, you'd expect that thing to be greater the more sort of brutal you are in your, in your choice of protocol, right? It's like, you know, you might try to be an I do an isothermal transformation pumping your bicycle, do it very, very slowly, you expend just delta F, but of course you never pump your bicycle like that. You, you pump much harder and then you, ex you generate much more energy, and that energy is essentially the excess of that free energy difference shift. Right? <coughs> so this contribution, this dissipated work, right, is essentially the, I'm, I'm going to call it a type of entropy production in this context, and this will become clear in just a second. So let's just wheel it back to what the first and second law would say. So the first and second law would say that the energy change now along the isothermal path is actually the sum of two path-dependent quantities, the average work plus the heat exchange with the bath. Okay? So there is no heat exchange with the bath in what I'm talking about until the end. Right? So if I go back to this picture, you have to imagine this is a two-step process where you first you pump very hard with the unitary, and then you, you allow for a relaxation step of sigma back to rho f. Right? So you, you split this type of process in two. Okay? So you, you basically you imagine you, know, you wait for relaxation, and it goes back to the to thermal equilibrium at that point in parameter space, right? so in some sense, three. But thermodynamics, delta F, delta U, delta S, strictly speaking, is only really defined along the isothermal line, right? because these are the only these are the only states in thermal equilibrium. So the question is now, can we make some statement regarding the excess sort of energy, this dissipative work, and how does that sort of appear within the context of the thermodynamic laws, right? So very simple. So the first law says delta U, the energy change along the path, the sum of the two path-dependent quantities, the work and the heat. Delta S, the entropy change of the system, is given by beta times Q plus, in general, this term which I call big sigma, right? So this big sigma is the irreversible entropy produced, which would be zero in an isothermal process. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask you about this uh, distinction you were making about the unitarity of the two uh, processes, uh, the one where you go to uh, rho prime and the isothermal one. So th this point you're making about unitarity, um, let's say in the top process you're saying this is unitary, always like from the eyes of the system, right? Whereas the bottom one 
it's not unitary from the eyes of the system, but if you sort of, let's say, consider an environment it's interacting with, both are unitary. That's yes. the point you're making. Yes, yeah, so, so, so let me put it this way. The, the way that I'm doing um, thermodynamics now is really kind of, it's a bit, you kind of split into a two-step process. It is more complicated, and if I have time, I go on to it, where you're really in contact with the bath when you perform, like when you really model the bath via some open systems formalism, whether that's a master equation, whether that's a map or whatever, and you change lambda. This is actually a very difficult problem from a technical perspective, but there are approaches that we actually still work on in, in my group and in other groups. So how you actually write down effective equations for the situation that Jake just described, which is when you're in contact with a thermal bath, a real thermal bath, and you change lambda, the problem is that you compromise with, 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 with a lot of sort of uh, manipulations of lambda, um, you compromise often the conditions under which you've derived your equations for. So for example, slowness uh, and all this type of thing that comes into the, you know, the Born approximation master equation kind of goes out the window in general unless you're very slow, okay? So I'll talk about this later, but let me just go on in this framework of this two-step process because I've always found it quite, quite illuminating. So we just imagine you do something fast described by unitary, then you allow for your relaxation step, right? So your state functions are well-defined. Yeah? The process sort of com is a combination of a unitary process and some dissipative process. Um, so you have the first and second law, and then you, of course, also have the fundamental thermodynamic relation that connects the state, quant this, the state functions. So because F is equal to U minus TS, in an isothermal process, then delta F yeah, is equal to delta U yeah, minus delta S over beta. Okay? This is just a fundamental thermodynamic relation. You learn it in, I don't know, secondary school or something like this, right? So um, delta U is now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just plug, the, um, plug the, the second law into the first law through Q, right? So delta U is equal to the average work, and I'm substituting in the definition for Q coming from the second law, right? And I get plus delta S over beta, yeah? Um, minus the big sigma over beta, okay? This implies that the work, yeah, minus the irreversible entropy over beta is equal to delta F. And what you can see is that now you get this quantity which is exactly beta times the average work minus delta F. So this is the new sort of thing that comes in in this framework of a non-equilibrium transformation. You can see that you get this contribution to the second law, right, which is big sigma, which is actually connected to the isothermal deviation, the excess energy you put in, which, is manif which gives a contribution to the entropy change of the system in addition to the standard reversible heat exchange with the bath, okay? So now the question is, can I prove that this thing is strictly positive? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that this thing can be written as a quantum relative entropy, and then you can use the positivity of the quantum relative entropy to prove, essentially, the positivity of that object. Because delta S, delta S is not strictly positive, right? Delta S can be easily negative, or can, be, can decrease in a thermodynamic process. A cooling process is a perfectly valid thermodynamic process, but this sigma is strictly positive on average, okay? So that's the, 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 the manifestation of being out of equilibrium, right? So, so let's, 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 let's try, and try and work through this and show that this thing can be recast as a relative entropy. Okay, so we see by definition this thing is average work minus delta F. Let's put in what the average work is. Remember, the average work is the trace of this state sigma, h uh, lambda tau, the Hamiltonian at the final point in parameter space, is the, the final energy minus the initial energy is the work, right? Rho uh, lambda i beta, h uh, lambda i. Sorry, I'm completely abusing the notation. Let me be consistent. Lambda tau is the same as lambda f, okay? and lambda i is the same as lambda zero. Yeah. Uh, minus delta f, right? So plus beta minus one log 
zf uh, minus beta minus 1 log uh, zi. So remember now that the entropy, the von Neumann entropy, yeah, is uh, basically the same as E minus F. U minus F, I mean, sorry, what did I call U? I call this as U minus F, right? <coughs> so using this sort of standard thermodynamic relation, you can write down that this thing over beta is equal to minus the von Neumann entropy of the initial state, so rho, um, say, lambda i beta over beta plus the trace of uh, sigma h lambda f. Okay, so I'm going to put this inside the trace. It's just a number log z f. Okay. So take this part here. Just as a rewriting, that's all, okay? I can rewrite this thing as minus the trace of sigma log rho f, uh, well, what do I call it? Rho lambda f beta. So this is the final thermal equilibrium state, right? So rho beta lambda f is equal to z lambda f minus 1. Uh, exponential minus beta h lambda f. So this implies that this thing here is equal to minus s, yeah, rho lambda i beta, so the, the von Neumann entropy of the initial state, yeah, minus the von Neumann entropy of the initial state, minus the trace <coughs> of sigma log rho lambda f beta, okay? Notice that s rho lambda i beta is equal to s u rho lambda i beta u dagger is equal to s of sigma because rho lambda i, the initial thermal state, is trivially unitarily connected to sigma. So its entropy is the same. The entropy of sigma and the initial rho are the same. Okay. So you can say that this thing is minus s of sigma, yeah, minus the trace of sigma log, and you're done, right? Rho beta i. Okay. And this is equal to s of sigma uh, rho lambda f beta. Okay, so this is positive by Klein's inequality because you're able to express it as a relative entropy and you know the relative entropy is positive, but this is intuitive, right? If you think about it. Looking back at this picture, if I can go back, are people finished? So if I go back here, what this expression tells me, okay, is um, that the state sigma is, I mean, the amount of dissipation in the process, yeah, is given to you by the statistical distinguishability of the density matrix generated by you and the thermal state at the same point in parameter space, okay? If you were, ice, you reached, you know, rho f in an isothermal way, that would be zero, uh, because the relative entropy is zero for states that are the same. So in this picture, when you see, you get this very nice insight that dissipation is connected to the distinguishability, the statistical di distinguishability between density operators manifested in the relative entropy, okay? So that was the first sort of time that I saw personally the, the, the relative entropy connected to thermodynamic quantities, 
I read about it initially in papers by Sebastian Deffner and Eric Lutz as part of Sebastian Deffner's PhD thesis, but then I realized later that very similar results in the 80s by Matt Donald also existed very expressed to free energy as a relative entropy, et cetera, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Let me actually go through an aside. I think we're doing okay on time. So what time is, are we finishing at? 10, 10 past 10, okay, that's perfect. Then I, can, then I can do a couple of things in 10 minutes. So what I was saying is that, so this, these, this sort of idea of um, expressing dissipation as a relative entropy, you can also do this for open systems, right? Um, in, a, in a very non-trivial way for Lindblad, so for semi-groups, et cetera, by Spahn. These are results, Spahn and Lebowitz of the 70s. But these, this sort of way of doing it with this isolated system is uh, Defner, uh, Lutz. There's two PRLs. I mean, one of them is called generalized Clausius. And, they talk, and the other thing you can do is you can provide further bounds on the dissipation because the relative entropy has other mathematical properties that you can, you can kind of manipulate, et cetera. But I don't want to get into that because I just want to give you this sort of essence, a longer course, and we could do some sort of bounds there. Generalized Clausius inequality. But what I want to show you is somehow sometimes we, we often, you know, we, we forget that other stuff has been done in the past. Um, and I wanted to show you something that I think was first shown to me by, by, by Vladko, actually, which is a, a paper by Matthew Donald, okay, um, 1987. It's a J stats phys um, 49.1, okay? And I mean, he, he basically, uh, well, what did he do? He basically, he basically said, okay, if I have any state rho, any state rho, and I consider its energy, okay? Let me just say the energy is U, uh, trace of rho with some Hamiltonian H, okay? So you can always sort of mock up the following. You can always write this as a trace of uh, rho log uh, e to the minus beta h. Just a trick, right? You can always do that. You agree? Why not? This is the rewriting of trace rho h. But interestingly enough, you show that this thing, okay, if you look at that paper, it's, it's nicely done. Minus one, beta one, trace um, rho log, now I'm gonna put e to the minus beta h over z, okay? Minus beta minus one log, sorry, trace uh, rho log z. So log z is just a number, yeah? The free energy is just a number. It's just Bear with me a second. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna take the above expression, which is just a rewriting, okay? And you're gonna just add and subtract the entropy. So I'm adding, sorry, subtracting SV, the von Neumann entropy of rho, and I'm adding it. Just. plus F, because look, this thing is just, the trace of rho will come out, it's just equal to one, and you get log of Z times beta minus one, okay, so it's just F, that one. So this thing is, by definition, actually, inverse relative entropy of rho, which is any state, and this sort of thermal state that you've defined, okay, plus beta minus one, SV of rho plus F. So this is U. This is true always for any rho. You see, if rho is thermal, yeah, relative entropy is zero, and you get back with something you know, right? Which is thus the F is equal to U minus TS. 
but you can do that for any row. Yeah? So that's in this McDonald's paper where he discusses the relationship between relative entropy and the free energy. Depending on the community, if you talk to people from, say, resource theories backgrounds, yeah, they will actually define this relative entropy contribution as a non-equilibrium free energy because in the context of their interest, you can extract you can extract work from allowing a system to relax to thermal equilibrium, but you know, it's not necessarily the way I think about things, but this is, this is another story, okay? We can, we can discuss it. But some people define this thing as a non-equilibrium free energy, okay? Where this becomes useful, and this is the last thing that I'm gonna say before the, before the break, is that maybe I can leave it as an exercise if, because we can move on to some, some other stuff after, after the break, but um, if you consider the following picture, say rho, which is an arbitrary state, it's not in thermal equilibrium, and you want to consider the work done on that, okay, to go to sigma, which is rho, we call it rho zero, um, the dagger, and now you consider the sort of isothermal path underneath it, which is in the same point in points in parameter space as above. This is delta F, this is rho beta lambda zero, okay, this is rho beta lambda tau, Okay? Um, convince yourself that the following is true. In this context, because you don't, st you don't start in thermal equilibrium anymore. Rho is out of equilibrium from the off, and you do some manipulation of it, right? But you can show, using fairly easily now, using this Donald identity, or Donald expression in, in, in the paper, that the average work which is the energy change along this path, okay? So rho zero and sigma here are really not thermo thermodynamic, uh, they're not in thermal equilibrium at all. You can say that W minus delta F is a difference of two relative entropies. So it's the inverse, so let me just say, um, this is, I'll leave it as an exercise, okay? Uh, S sigma rho lambda tau, it's thermal equilibrium state, minus S uh, rho uh, zero, rho lambda zero, beta. So in this, in this situation, yeah, you get this additional contribution, right? And that makes sense, because it's really only in the situation where the initial state is thermal, okay, that you're going to get positivity on average. If the, if the initial state is out of equilibrium, then this dissipation can be, can be positive or negative because the thing is, you can write it as a difference of two relative entropies, right? Um, the other thing before we finish up that you can show which is connected, I see Francesco Plastina down there, is uh, something that uh, Francesco and other people uh, looked at before which is you don't look at the isothermal deviation, but you imagine you want to, you want, you want to compute the, you know, the energy in excess of an adiabatic transformation. Okay, so what do I mean by an adiabatic transformation? I know that Steve talked about them yesterday. An adiabatic transformation is essentially uh, a transformation which preserves the probability of the initial state. So it's unitary, okay? And so if you calculate the adiabatic deviation, it's sometimes called a friction, you can also show using that Donald expression that it turns out to be the difference of two relative entropies. So I won't go through it, but I'll leave you play around with that concept, and that has other interesting properties. But what I will say, and if I have time, I'll go on to it, the friction in general does not fulfill a fluctuation theorem, okay, which we're going to talk about in the next thing, but the dissipated work or the W minus delta F starting from thermal equilibrium does, okay, in general. Um, so we'll leave it there, we'll take a break and we'll come back and we'll talk about some open systems after the break. <laughs>